G'day, Nary. Kate here. Continuing with the third message in the baggage series, Adam addressed the problem with anger and the emotions that surround it. He asks, if God took your anger, what would you ask him to replace it with? So two weeks ago, we started this conversation called baggage, and we started it by just trying to, we started with what I hope was a confession. Uh, Because as we talk about keeping short accounts, that's what some people, the way they refer to this whole forgiving others thing, or uh, my friend Fred who says learning to be unoffendable, which doesn't mean that you're never offended, it means you know how to deal with it when you are, uh, or just simply learning to forgive others. What we've started by exploring was that this is hard work, and the confession was none of us comes out of the chute good at this. This isn't something that we're naturally able to do, like Oliver in all of his oneness the age of one, uh, like he doesn't know how to do this yet. Like this is a life skill. And so we tried to start by just this confession of this is hard. And it's also unique. Uh, We looked at some pretty robust research put together by John Ortberg where where he explores that up until Jesus of Nazareth, it wasn't even a moral ideal that that you could probably go anywhere in Helena today and ask people whether learning to forgive others is is the right moral decision. And the general sentiment is going to be, yeah, and what, no matter what they think about Jesus or God or the Bible or any of those things. And yet the reality is uh, that prior to a couple thousand years ago, that wouldn't have been the case. That what was normal was, was strict loyalty to your friends and, and strict disdain for your enemies. That's what was celebrated as, as moral and right and beautiful and good. And so if nothing else in that first week, I hope what we began to think about is th- th- this is radical and it's hard. And it's a reminder that, that Jesus can be very difficult and thus the need for grace is, is paramount. Last week then, Josh talked about guilt and shame and self-hatred and the myriad emotion that come with all of that. I got a lot of feedback from a lot of you who really enjoyed that, so I'm grateful for that. This morning what I want to do is talk about the emotion that quite frankly is most likely to create the need uh, for this thing called forgiveness. Uh, maybe we could start this way. Do you ever get mad? Do you, do you, do you, do you ever lose your temper? Do you ever lie? Because nobody's raising their hand. Do you ever get mad? Do you ever lose your temper? Yeah, thanks. Uh, that, that, that's the emotion that makes all of this uh, in some ways needed, right? Not, not the only one, but, but close. I, I was thinking about it this week. The first time my wife saw me lose my temper, we, we were married. I was 21, so we were young. I think the first time she lost me, just completely lose my cool, was um, after we were married. We lived in this basement apartment. And, and it involved a cat, which I feel like at that point we should debate whether or not it was even like justifiably wrong because like, I mean, sorry if you're a cat lover, but somehow it's like if a cat's involved, then it's probably okay. Which got me thinking, have you heard, have you seen that, the, the diary thing, the difference between cats and dogs? I mean, you seen that? I, I brought it just for some anecdotal uh, humor. So, so here we go. The dog's diary, uh, 8 a.m. Dog food, my favorite thing. 9.30 a.m., a car ride, my favorite thing. 9.40 a.m., a walk in the park, my favorite thing. 10.30 a.m., got rubbed and petted, my favorite thing. Noon, milk bones, my favorite thing. Here, here, here's the cats. Day 983 of my captivity. <laughs> kind of says it all right there, right? Uh, my, tap, my captors continue to taunt me with bizarre little dangling objects. They dine lavishly on fresh meat while the other inmates and I are fed hash or some, some sort of dry nuggets. Although I make my contempt for the rations perfectly clear, I nevertheless must eat something in order to keep up my strength. The only thing that keeps me going is my dream of escape. In an attempt to disgust them, I once again vomit on the carpet. (laughs) You're laughing because you know how normal this is. Today I decapitated a mouse and dropped its headless body at their feet. I'd I'd hope this would strike fear in their hearts since it clearly demonstrates my capabilities. However, they merely made condescending comments about what a good little hunter I am. Bastards. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> 1 p.m., played in the yard, my favorite thing. This is the dog. Uh, 1 p.m., played in the yard, my favorite thing. 3 p.m., wagged my tail, my favorite thing. 5 p.m., dinner, my favorite thing. 7 p.m., got to play ball, my favorite thing. 8 p.m., wow, watch TV with the people, my favorite thing. 11 p.m., sleeping on the bed, my favorite thing. Back to the cat. Because <laughs> they, 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 don't, they don't have friends, they have, they have like captors, right? That's what we're getting at here. They have servants. There was some sort of assembly of their accomplices tonight. I was placed in solitary confinement for the duration of the event. However, I could hear the noises and smell the food. I overheard that my confinement was due to the power, power of quote-unquote allergies. I must learn what this means and how to use it to my advantage. <laughs> 
Today I was almost successful in an attempt to assassinate one of my tormentors by weaving around his feet as he was walking. I must try this again tomorrow, but at the top of the stairs. I'm convinced that the other prisoners here are flunkies and snitches. The dog receives special privileges. He is regularly released and seems to be more than willing to return. He is obviously stupid. The bird must be an informant. I observe observe him communicate with the guards regularly. I'm certain that he reports my every move. My captors have arranged protective custody for him in an elevated cell. So he is safe for now. So this moment... uh, what happened was we lived in this basement apartment. It was kind of a dive and it was very cheap and we were in college and one day we were leaving and the lady who lived above us in this house, uh, she, she had at least a couple of cats and a dog and I think a bird and just that she was kind of the pet lady and we, we were leaving and I remember standing, I distinctly remember standing there looking in the, the kitchen window, her window, and there was this cat laying in the window and I remember making some comment of like, oh, cute, look at that calico cat and we didn't think much more of it. Next day, and I I had no idea how uh, devious this probably was until later, and I put all the dots together. Next day, it just so happened that when we got home, that woman was outside, and she she proceeded to inform us that, sadly, she was going to have to get rid of one of the cats tomorrow and was going to take at least one of them to the pound, and they'd probably be euthanized, unless, of course, we knew somebody who wanted to adopt a cat. So we took a cat. And, you know, it was mildly enjoyable until we had kids, and then we were like, who has time for this? But there was a day where the cat, here's the temper moment, the, the cat knocked over a house plant, and I didn't grow up with pets, and I don't know necessarily how to train them, but I knew enough to know that like, when the dog pees on the floor, he rubs his nose in it, and that's what tells him not to do it again, right? It's just like pet training circa 1963. And so I thought, well, same thing must follow. You, you rub the cat's nose in the dirt, and then he knows not to knock the house plant over again. But, but the cat didn't like the idea, so when I picked up the plant and was trying to rub its, I think I actually did successfully rub its nose in it. I'm going to get arrested for animal abuse abuse, but I think I did successfully rub his nose in it once, and, it was, and, and then it tried to leave, and so it was running circles in our tiny little be- bedroom, and I was chasing it with this plant, and needless to say, making a far larger mess than it had ever made it in, on its own, and my wife walked in, and this cat was running from me doing this like <laughs> thing, because it was trying to get the dirt out of its nose, and she thought we were playing a game, and then she saw my face, and there was that like, oh, I didn't know you had this capability. Let me ask you again, do you, do you ever get mad? Ever lose your temper? Here, here's the question, because I, I think probably all of us have struggled with this. Some of you, from a church context, you've, you've wrestled with God in your anger. Some of you don't come from a church context. You've wrestled, with, wrestled with, with anger in general, maybe with a therapist, maybe with some reading, maybe by, by having a bad moment, and then you made this kind of decision as you were driving to work. But both of us can probably relate to this. Have you ever prayed to God and asked him to take away your anger? Like, you ever, like, genuinely, sincerely said, God, take away my anger, and you thought he did, and then five minutes later, someone pulled out in front of you, and you're like, dang, that didn't work. Or have you ever taken a class or read a book or made a really firm commitment on your drive to work? Or if you're a parent, you wake up in the morning, and there's that, like, ugh, and you feel that guilt that comes with being an imperfect parent. Have you ever just committed to yourself you were done getting angry, and then five minutes later, you did it again? Here, for me, is the question, and... Uh, I'm indebted to Dallas Willard, who's kind of framed this for me in this way. I've been working on this literally for 15 years. He did some writing in a book called The Divine Conspiracy that I've been trying to apply. And it's hard, but it still makes the most sense to me. Here's my question is, if God took away your anger, or if that book or that therapist, if you don't want to include God in it, that's fine too. But if God took away your anger, what would he replace it with? And could it be that part of the fault that we have in the way we approach and deal with anger is we keep focusing on what not to do, and in doing, we fail to focus on the positive opposite? Dallas Willard makes the point in The Divine Conspiracy that that if you were trying to go to New York, not going to L.A. would be a really terrible strategy for getting to New York. And if you stop and think about that, it's a little bit simplistic, but but his point is that if if, if you were setting out for New York and did so by avoiding going to L.A., which is probably worth your while anyway, when, when you got off the airplane, it's, it's highly unlikely that the Uber driver would look at you in New York and go, congratulations on avoiding L.A. When you checked into your hotel or saw whatever friends you were visiting or family or whatever, it's highly unlikely that they would greet you by saying, congratulations on avoiding L.A. No, you, what we know instinctively is you get to New York by what? By trying to go to New York. And, and, and avoiding L.A. happens somewhat naturally if you have the destination of New York in mind. Here's my question. What, what if this is part of what we do with anger and with lots of other things? What if part of Jesus' thesis in the Sermon on the Mount 
which says, listen, 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 my, my way is not about behavior modification, but heart transformation. What if anger becomes a pretty vivid example of what he means by that? That he's not just trying to teach you what not to do, but to give you the type of character that enables you to do certain things that bring honor and glory to him. You know, uh, President Eisenhower, you, you, you may be familiar, if nothing else, he's on some coinage. He's a pretty important person in our history. In fact, was instrumental in, in World War II and in the victory of the Normandy invasion in particular. He, he was raised in a very fundamentalist conservative home. Uh, he had older brothers, and he tells a story in a, in a book called Road to Character. He, he tells a story that when he was 10 years old, his older brothers asked for permission to go trick-or-treating. They were granted permission, but then trick-or-treating was a far more adventurous activity than it is today, and he as a 10-year-old was told he was too young. The result of which was he had a temper tantrum, like 10-year-old boys and 38-year-old boys do. He, 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 he lost his cool. He became red in the face. He ran outside, and he, and he proceeded to pound on an adult uh, apple tree with his fists. The result were his hands were messed up, and they were bleeding, and his dad reprimanded him and told him that's, how not, to, that's not how to behave and sent him to his room. And he was laying on his bed sobbing. And eventually he says his mom, her her name was Ida, she came in and she sat in a rocking chair next to his bed and just kind of waited for him to chill out. And eventually she quoted this proverb to him. She said this, He that conquereth his own soul is greater than he who taketh a city. Now more contemporary translations speak directly to the idea of anger, but she began then as she was bandaging his wounds, talking to him, not about not getting mad, but about the danger that comes with anger. She began, he would talk about towards the end of his life, like that moment felt like hours long, but in hindsight, it probably wasn't more than 15 minutes. But her agenda in that moment was to help him appreciate that anger was a real human emotion that if not managed, would sabotage his future. In fact, he, he, he shares this quote from that moment. Go, go ahead to that next slide. He said, ang- she said, anger and hatred are burning inside. Hatred is a futile thing which only injures the person who harbors it. Interesting, isn't it? That she didn't tell him not to get angry, but warned him that if, if not managed well, it'll sabotage you. And, and in some sense, the reminder of that story for me, it, it just helps me take a deep breath to be reminded like, oh, wow, okay, so high-functioning, highly productive people. I think we have that picture of him at Normandy. I don't know if you'd had that up there yet, sorry. But, But that picture with him and those soldiers, that's him talking to the soldiers who the next day would storm the beaches of Normandy. Crazy to think that he's probably, every person in that picture in all likelihood mathematically died 24 hours later. That a man who had that kind of impact on the world would spend the rest of his life, and in fact, he referenced that moment and said for the rest of his life, what he understood is he needed certain tools that would allow him to manage his anger, that not getting mad wasn't going to help him in that regard. So here's what I would like to do this morning, is just spend a few minutes. What Jesus does in Matthew 5, that section that that Jessica read, my, my opinion, my bias, and I'm indebted to Dallas Willard and others on this, is that what Jesus does here is he kind of unpacks what anger is, And then he goes like, but here's New York. Like, here's the real destination. So let's just look back at Matthew 5, 21. I'm sorry if this feels a little telling this morning. I I, I don't know. I worked hard on it, but it still had a little, it felt a little luxury. But I just want to talk about, here's what he's saying about anger. 5, 21. You've heard that it was said, people long ago, you shall not murder. And we all kind of know that, right? And anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. And now what he's going to do is move the bar from murder to anger. But one of the questions we have to ask here, and, and, and you can spend some time with this in your own study, is, is he saying don't get angry? Or is he offering a warning that the real issue isn't murder, it's where anger will take you if you don't have good tools for managing your anger? Here's what Dallas Willard says uh, about this whole. His argument is that what Jesus is un- unpacking here is that anger is a natural emotional response to what he calls a thwarted will. In other words, and here's where I think there might be some dysfunction to praying and asking God to take away anger. Because none of you would pray and ask God to take away joy. None of you would pray and ask God to take away grief, although we might, but we know that it's a part of life. See, the suggestion Dallas Willard's making is so long as you live in an imperfect, in an imperfect world, 
where people are going to pull out in front of you and, and teachers are, are going to interact with you or students are going to interact with you in ways that are bump up against your will or, or bosses are going to treat you ways that you shouldn't be treated or umpires are going to make bad calls. As long as you live in an imperfect world, your will, your plans are going to get interrupted, which is going to create an emotional response of, I don't like this. And thus, it's the skills that have to follow that. Listen to the way James uh, speaks on this whole issue. James, by the way, was Jesus' half-brother, so what's ironic to me about this is if it's true that he had such an astute understanding of anger, it would only seem like it would make sense because he grew up with Jesus. Listen to James 4, which, by the way, if you're looking to kind of start your own devotional life in the morning, there's not a better place to spend 10 minutes tomorrow morning in the book of James. It is just so straightforward and practical. James 4.1, what causes fights and quarrels among you? So here's the question. Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Notice he, he's saying it's, it's circumstantial. It's when things don't go your way, you get mad. You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. And that kind of moved the target a little bit. He's going like, listen, listen, listen. When things don't go your way, you're going to get mad. And then he continues, you do not have because you do not, do not ask God. Now, maybe a little bit parenthetically, but this is not him saying that if you ask God, he'll give you everything you want. No, what he's pointing to is we naturally want things and that the healthy emotional posture is your kingdom come, your will be done, that we surrender desires to God, that we learn to go like, okay, I kind of want this, but here, Lord, I want your will and I'll trust your will even when it doesn't make sense to me. But again, it's the same conversation that James is suggesting Anger in and of itself isn't bad. It's, it's where it can take you. Or, or, or consider Ephesians 4. I'm going to jump that next slide, Lisa. Uh, in Ephesians 4, listen to the way Paul t- speaks about this. He, he se- seems to take a similar stance, which is also itself a quote of Psalm 4. Listen to this. In your anger, do not sin. Again, is he saying don't get angry? Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. Now, some of you are going like, okay, I'm uncomfortable. I don't even know what to do with this whole devil thing. What he's illustrating here is what happens if we don't deal with our anger in healthy ways. Ever met somebody and your response is just like, they're just angry. And you're like, at who? And you're like, I don't know. They're just angry. Ever work for somebody like that? Or maybe you were married to someone like that? Or maybe you are someone like that? Though the only person that doesn't know that is probably you and me. Andy Stanley talks about this passage this way. His, his argument is the danger of letting the sun go down on your anger. It's not like this werewolf thing. The danger is if that happen, if too many cycles of life happen after an offense has occurred and you don't clean it up, then what eventually happens? You forget. You don't lose the emotion because you've stored something up. But you forget what the original source was. Ever go to a family reunion? And there's this like, I don't know why I don't like you. I mean, I do, but I don't actually remember the specifics. I just know I don't like you. What is that? It's letting the sun go down on your anger. And again, it's all predicated around this realistic warning that anger is going to happen. It's it's what we choose to do with it. And to me, this is encouraging because it would say that in some sense, managing anger is like managing lots of other vices in life. Addictions like alcohol and pornography or prescription drugs or not staring at your phone too much or not working too much. It's impulse control, isn't it? It's learning to go, okay, I am emotionally aware that that guy just pulled out in front of me. And I'm going to try to build tools into my life to recognize I feel that and then begin to respond in certain ways. What if, what if Jesus is a little bit free in his sense of like, I got good news and bad news. The bad news is you're going to get mad today. The good news is together we can learn the tools to how to do that and not have it sabotage your life. So Jesus continues, uh, 522. I told you I got a little lecture. You just give me a second. 522. Uh, but I tell you that anyone who is angry with a brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Judgment, by the way, is a reference to the Jewish Sanhedrin, which was the 70 judges in Israel who were thought by the rabbis to be the earthly representation of the heavenly court. So he's going like, you know, it's like the principal's office. Anger, if you're not careful, will get you in the principal's office. Again, anyone who says to a brother or sister, Raka, not to be confused with Veruca, the RVCA brand, is answerable to the court. And anyone who says, you fool, will be in the dangers of the fire of hell. Raka is, it's, it's, a, it's our version of idiot or tool or moron, all of which I've used 16 times each today, probably. 
not literally, but, but it's its own cultural expression of someone pulling out in front of them and they go, Raka, you go, moron. So here's what Jesus is getting at here. Anger, unsupervised, becomes contempt. Contempt, we know we have it. How? Because out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. See, his concern here is with anger that goes sideways and comes out as calling out the value of another person. There's this whole conversation that happens, especially uh, when your oldest becomes 13, about cussing and why it's bad and it's just a four-letter word and what's the big deal, right? Not that you've had this, but I, I think there's a whole conversation, even within Christian subculture right now, that there's this kind of rebellious vein that goes like, we can cuss and still be Christians, and I suppose the, the reality is that's true. And that, it's just weird. It's like lots of cultural things that swing from one extreme to the other. I think to the degree to which Jesus weighs into that, it's right here. Because notice Jesus isn't calling out cussing per se. He's calling out cursing. He's calling out using language in such a way that is a reflection of a lack of self-control that's really predicated upon anger, that's really predicated on the fact that that person doesn't have value and ought not to exist. And on that letter, we can say pink with contempt in our voice, right? That the issue is, are you managing in healthy ways your anger? Which gets me back to this question. So, if God took away your anger, or rather, if you were going to try to channel the energy in a more positive direction, what does that look like? And here's where I think Jesus proves his incredible intellect, if not insight into the heart of God. Therefore, if you were offering your gift at the altar and there remember your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar, first go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. Now, here's a little map. Stick with me for just a second because this is going to get long and boring and then I think it might mean something. So, map of Israel, Jesus' day, Sea of Galilee, up to the north. The Sermon on the Mount occurred, this passage we're reading, that teaching occurred in all likelihood on the northwest shore of the Sea of Galilee. Jerusalem, down to the south, at the top of the Dead Sea. Rugged mountain. It's it's 123 kilometers, which means nothing to anybody other than Kate. Uh, But... (laughs) So it's 76 and a half miles. The contemporary, the thinking was that in that day, that was a five days journey on foot. Think walking from here to Lincoln. I mean, it's, it's, it's rugged, dry land. Here's what Jesus is doing here. Now, one other contextual thing. In Jesus' day, of course, the Bible said every Jew should go to the Jerusalem multiple times a year for certain holy days. But in Jesus' day, especially in the Galilee, the economic situation was such that in all likelihood, you as a well-intentioned Jewish person might make one trip to the temple in your entire life. So think like Yankee Stadium or Wrigley Field or the Super Bowl or your favorite concert, or maybe you are planning on going to the, the Holy Land or Hawaii like that place that you've spent your whole life thinking about, saving for, wanting to go. Here's what Jesus is doing. He's going, so if you get there, like you've waited your whole life for this, you get there and suddenly you remember, wait a minute, I just had harsh words with my teacher and I don't think we patched that up. Here's what you need to do. You need to leave your gift sitting there. You need to walk back to to your teacher. You need to walk back to your friend. You need to do everything you can to make amends, then turn around and walk back to the temple. It's obtuse. It's hyperbole. It's ridiculous. It's not frankly possible, but Jesus is making a point. And the point he's making is about the value of religion for religion's sake, isn't he? I mean, look at the intersection he just brought you to. What's God's priority? This person that he's referenced is on the cusp of the most religiously important thing in their world, literally, offering an off, a gift at the altar of the temple. And simultaneously, this person remembers that there's a relationship that's not right. And Jesus is going, in that moment, what's God's priority? What is he saying about the value of religion for religion's sake? What is he saying about the purpose of, say, a Sunday morning at Grand Street Theater as a community called Narrate? I would argue that what he's saying is it, this is valuable to the degree that it re-energizes us to step into another week where we try to do the work of loving God by loving people. I would argue that if Sunday doesn't help you do that, then you should find a better church that does help you do that. It doesn't make this unimportant. It gives purpose to this. And your quiet times and the radio stations you listen to, all the religious stuff. It's a reminder that for Jesus, loving God isn't an end unto itself. We love God, we love people, 
simultaneously. We did this series a couple falls ago called Simple But Demanding where we tried to illustrate that there are certain things that are really easy but really difficult and that when you talk about Jesus in these terms, it sounds easy, but it's not. In some ways, it'd be way easier to go to the temple and offer the offerings than it is to go, wait a minute, God, my, the health in my relationship with you is defined by how I treat people, the person standing next to me? In fact, we, we just thought it'd be fun to pull from the archives and show you uh, this video from this series to kind of make that point. Welcome to Jean-Claude Grand Slam's art class. Thank you. Drawing one on one. Thanks. The first things that we have to draw is a perfect circle. The most beautiful of all, the kinds mm. of circles. What other kinds of circles are there? Imperfect. Mm. Dare Fine. accepted. Okay. You're a sassy woman. You seem to have an inflated sense of accomplishment. Well, my parents were always very supportive. My yes. parents told me to go out and get a baguette. This is the French life. It's a good, this, yes? It's a good stereotype. Okay, well, maybe it's a little bad, but I... Mean. Yes, it's exactly. That is what I'm saying. Finally, we can agree on something. No. Sad representation. You call that sad? What is this? Is this a lock of hairs? You no. think you are drawing okay. Justin Bieber? Well, yeah, no, look it. It is a happy excuse. Oh, and now um, this is more tragedy good. than comedy. You act like it is no problem. <laughs> It's like the, the world will keep spinning. This is not true. It's the foundation of all art. Okay. Agree to disagree. Disagree to disagree. Oh, so you agree now? No, I disagree to disagree with the... You are a smart woman. It's not about perfection. It's about, like, abstraction. And Your circle is definitely abstract. I do not even know it's a circle. Who are you? I'm Jean-Claude Grand Slam. Mm. The Denny's named the breakfast after me. The world spins in a perfect circle. No. No. <laughs> No. No? That was funny of me to draw the smiley face up. You trying to say something to me? Sure the smile? As if when you see me, your heart smiles on the inside? You have feelings for me, no? You, have, you are drawn by my animal magnetism, yes? We can leave this behind us, and we can move forward into a life where we forget that you are a terrible artist. I just don't know what to say. We? Just say we. We? Say we. Just say we. Just say we. Just say we. See, say we. It, great to meet you, Jean Claude. Why do you deny your heart? Why do you deny the love that is flowing between us? I don't. <laughs> In case you're creeped out, just as a reference, that's his wife. So just, just so we're clear on that. What if part of what Jesus is doing here is, is something that he did over and over and over and over again, which is to remind people that it's valuing people that God cares deeply about. That a love of God and a relationship with God is supposed to drive a love of God and a respect and value of people. And that doesn't make that necessarily uh, easy, but nonetheless, very, very clear. Maybe we could do it this way. Uh, if, if you, will you pull out your smartphone? Pull out your phone. I'm just assuming if you don't have a smartphone, then maybe you could find a piece of stone and a chisel. And, or, or you could beckon the pigeon as you leave. To, I, my, I'm just going to confess, my phone is completely off because the boys are in the middle of a baseball game right now and it would be inundated with texts and I would be very distracted, so I'm not going to participate with you on this. But here's what I'd challenge you to do. What, what if you were to create in your calendar, go to your calendar app, and just create a five-day reminder that once a day over the next five days, you get a prompt. Don't, don't this for, do, do this forever because right, it's like any other thing that we try to do forever. We, we become numb to it. What, what if you got a text sometime tomorrow, sometimes Tuesday, sometime Wednesday, sometimes Thursday, sometime Friday that it just said, how, how you doing at valuing people? And what if we turned our attention away from don't get angry to valuing people. Here's one of the scary things uh, about confession and acknowledgement of fault. Oftentimes it's very selfish. Oftentimes our apologies for getting angry, we're not apologizing for the way that made that person feel. We're apologizing, apologizing for the inconvenience it brought to our relationship for the way it made us feel. I would argue Jesus challenges us to take the value to a higher level and goes, no, no, no. H how are you doing at valuing people? So they can stand up tomorrow and love God and love people a little more effectively because you're blessing their life. So what if you got a prompt? While you're doing that, let me just remind you where Jesus talked about prayer. We'll, we'll close here. But remember, we did this last spring where we talked about the, the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer, and that this is a prayer that if we kind of, it can frame our whole worldview. And here we go, verse 9, Our Father in heaven, 
Our Father who's right here, we talked about, hallowed be your name, like your glory, not mine. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There it is, that emotional separation from what we have to have. Give us today our daily bread. We are finite, dependent beings. We can't control outcomes. And here's where I wanted to get to. And forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Tell me, what's the result of a person who takes seriously their need for God's forgiveness on a regular basis? Like, is God creating some kind of punitive thing? Like, if you don't, then I won't. Or is God saying, if you take seriously the cross and how desperate you are for my grace, then you will naturally step back into relationships with others knowing that forgiveness, grace, is what makes relationships healthy and happen. What, what happens if we take the focus off of anger a little bit and focus instead on a God who invites us to love him and love people? Next week, I want to spend a little bit more energy on this. Let me pray, and we're going to sing our way out. God, Lord, it would be so easy to be trite on this one because quite frankly, we've, we've spent decades developing our responses to anger and disappointment and thwarted will. And so to think that a single sermon or a single moment or a single prompt on our phone is going to pull us out of that instantaneously would be naive. And yet we know Jesus, that you are a transforming, changing God who sends his grace when we ask for it. And so I pray that we'd put you on display uh, this week, this year, in this community over our lifetime by being a people who, who value the hard work of being unoffendable, who do the hard work of, of keeping short accounts and circling back and making things right. Jesus, would you protect us from a kind of religion that makes the religion the end unto itself and steer us to yourself? a God who wants to be valued and wants us to share the load of valuing people. We love you, Lord. Amen. If you would like to engage further with Narrate Church, you can find contact information online, www.narratechurch.org. We would love to hear from you.